maybe I will change my mind. So I think it's really critical to understand that you change people's minds, you know, by being their friends, by connecting to them, um, not by being antagonistic, not by sort of presenting yourself as the other. So the way you do that with people you don't know is you find out what you have common, in common. You ask questions, you dig around, you look for similarities. It's really, really important to establish those similarities. So empathy is important, similarity is important. And the next thing, um, which is really hard in a webinar because I can't see anything, I can't see any of you, but most of the time, what you really want in life is to know who you're talking to. What do they want? What might make them think differently about the world? Um, or how you can work with them to think about some behavior you're trying to get them to change. You need to know who they are. Um, so if you can figure out what people desire and make sure they get it, they're more likely to change or to give you what you want. And I think that kind of general advice that I kind of came across in the process of researching this book, you can use it in the smallest situation um, in an email, and you can use it in, a, in the context of speaking to hundreds of people um, or writing. You can, whenever I write, I, am, I try to think about who the audience is and what the audience, what bias the audience brings to that publication most likely, and what would be the best way to reach them. Um, on a more mundane level, I know it sounds really crass, but people like gifts. They like gifts and it helps to do favors for them. Um, that's why public relations people were always sending us things at the journal, uh, at the Wall Street Journal where I worked before the Times and at the Times because it makes a difference. Um, it shouldn't, but it does. It's subconscious, but it matters. Um, people also like to be flattered. There was one, I always thought, oh, people who are flattering people, you can see right through it, it's so silly. But there was an academic researcher who found that there is literally no limit to the amount of flattery that people like. Now, I'm not sure I totally agree with that. I think you can't seem smarmy, but flattery I think is very important in making a personal connection. So, you know, Giving someone something, it goes back to the idea of a gift. And you come across that in many different parts of your life. You certainly come across it in customer service or working with your employees. Um, when my book first came out, I was traveling a lot for it. And I was in a hotel where there was a real, a lot of noise from the air conditioning system outside the window. So I, I called the front desk and I said, I was very polite. I was actually very contrite. I said, I'm sorry, I know it's weird, but I hate noise. You know, even though I'm from New York, I hate noise. They were very nice. They gave me a really quiet room. They gave me a suite. Um, I didn't need a suite, but it was very generous of them. And it was smart because after, there's no way I was gonna go on TripAdvisor or some other site and complain about their noise. How could I complain when they had been so nice to me? So they averted a bad review and they made me feel like I owed them something. Um, and I did. And I'm not sure that I would have gotten that treatment if I had called and yelled. But whether I would have or not, I certainly know that by being so generous, they, they made a very good move. Um, because ultimately, gifts tend to be reciprocated in one way or another, and, and it, it makes a difference. Another thing that makes a difference, both from my experience as a journalist and from studying the area of persuasion is that you should never underestimate the value of asking. Um, if you want someone to do something, you, you need to ask them. Um, studies have also shown that people underestimate the odds that someone will say yes to a very direct request. You know, they think, oh, I couldn't ask her, I couldn't ask him, I couldn't possibly do that. But you can, and there's a, there's a good chance, probably a better chance than you think that that person will say yes. Um, one thing that people have asked me a lot was how do you get, how do I get someone to introduce me to someone who's important in my life that you know, someone who could help me? Um, that happens a lot in business, it happens in the world. And I think that most of us, um, 
most of us don't want to sort of go around willy nilly connecting people to anyone they think that's going to find it an imposition. Basically, you want you do things like that if you think the person that you know will benefit from talking to this person. So it's important that you make it clear that that the introduction will be mutually mutually beneficial. Um, so another thing to understand is that most people want to say yes. I have more of a problem with that than some people. I tend to say yes, probably more than I should. Some people think that's a female characteristic. I don't know, maybe it's generational, but there is some psychology that suggests that we are hardwired as, as beings to be helpful. And that may be why humanity has survived at least so far. So remember that people want most of the time to be helpful and to say yes, they don't like to say no. So because they don't like to say no, you can sort of take advantage of the fact that people are uncomfortable saying no. Um, from the smallest thing to the biggest thing. Obviously, the bigger it gets, the easier it is for them to say no. But um, another part of persuasion that people forget is that besides flattering people, you, um, you just want to be friendly and you want to make people like you. And that also helps. Um, you know, let's say you're having an event and there's somebody you want to attend that event. You have some extra tickets. You think that person would contribute something and you think they would donate something to the cause because many events are for one cause or another. So how do you do that? Um, you really need to think about what that person wants, not what you want. Persuasion is never about you. It's about the other person. It's about what the other person wants. So you might email that person saying, oh, your friends are gonna be there. And I know this group is doing things that really tie in with what you value in life and what you believe in. And also I think you will have fun. Oh, and by the way, you know, this person you know will definitely be there. So if you're trying to send an email like that, I, I've thought a lot about email because as the op-ed editor at the Times, I got thousands of emails every week. Um, a specific subject line makes a really big difference because then the email does not get lost in the hundreds that everyone gets. Um, and it's really important in email to end with some kind of action that has to be taken. I mean, if you just say, well, would you like this? If the person can sort of get away with not answering it, they'll probably not answer it at that moment. And I think most of us know if you don't answer it at that moment, the odds are very good that you will never answer it. So you always want something that requires action. So you might say at the end of that email, the situation I'm talking about, um, can I leave a ticket for you at the entrance? Um, I, leave, I will leave a ticket for you at the entrance. Please let me know if there's any problem with that. Because then the person has to write back and say yes or no. I can't do that. Um, some of the other things that I came across that I thought were interesting, it's, it's important to be humble. People talk a lot about the need for confidence and I don't think they talk enough about the need for humility and listening to other people and being quiet and saying, yeah, that could be true. You know, you're right, that could be true. That's interesting. Um, I see your point, I, I get it. Because there's, there's too much battering that goes on. And if you really want to persuade people, you know, I give you one point and you give me one point. Um, you just never want to make people defensive. Um, I was a boss for a long time at the New York Times. I was in management for many years. And I really think you learn to be a good boss, partly by experience, but partly I think there's some personality traits that are just better attuned to it. And I think some bosses can make people feel uncomfortable without even realizing they're doing it. They might say, you know, um, you should have finished that by now. You know, when you say that to someone, it makes them feel bad. And that's never a good way to get what you want. It makes people defensive. Um, when you're in political arguments, I mean, I guess one of the political arguments I care about the most is, is climate change. And I 
found it interesting that the scientists have found that if you force someone to explain their position, like if someone tells me, eh, they don't think it's any big deal. If I, if I can get them to explain why they believe that, science has found that it tends to make the person less aggressive and less convinced of their position because it's hard to explain the position. And then they kind of, once they walk through their point of view, people often find they can't totally explain why they believe what they believe. And so they just tend to ratchet down um, the intensity. So the other things that are important besides, you know, don't get people upset, don't get them angry. It's important to understand what they fear. Um, conservatives, and liberals tend to fear different things. Um, studies show that conservatives tend to react more strongly to physical threats than liberals do, which may be why they sort of classically, at least in the United States, support more spending on police and on the military. Um, liberals tend to think danger is more manageable. And it's important to think about those fears when you're trying to reach someone. So what about persuasion when it comes to like habits? What if you're trying to convince your wife to stop smoking? Bad habits are often reduced or eliminated by causing so much friction that they're too hard to pursue and therefore it's easier to introduce good ones. You know, like if you like chocolate, don't keep it in your house. If you want people to eat the food you put out at a party, put out small pieces of cheese and put out grapes. Don't put out things that are messy that people can't handle. I mean, that's kind of a goofy, small example, but you always need to put yourself in the other person's place. And if I were in that situation, what would I want? If a guest is coming to my house, would he want a hard pillow or a soft pillow or a choice of both? I mean, almost everything is about putting yourself in the other person's place. So if you want someone to stop doing something, then make it hard for them. If you want someone to stop smoking culturally, the way it was sort of the incidence was lowered was because it was disallowed everywhere. And there were just not that many places to smoke anymore. Um, you know, another, some people say that they want um, to socialize more and they're kind of freaked out by the pandemic and how are they gonna get back to social life? Um, I even knew people who would complain that they didn't see their closest friends even before as much as they wanted to because they were busy, busy, busy. And I think the way around that um, is to pre-schedule it, to have a standing walk or a standing coffee date so that you don't have to organize it each time because every time you have to organize something, you're creating a barrier to it. So it's kind of the, when things are set, they're more likely to happen. If it's something you don't want to do and it's not easy, it's less likely to happen. It's actually fairly simple once you apply your own sense of your own psychology to other people and sort of understand what we are, that we're all the same. Um, we're not literally all the same. Different political parties have different values. And in editing people when I was in op-ed, I tried... I tried to bring in a lot of conservatives because the New York Times was a liberal newspaper. And I would say the conservative writers had to work a little harder because they had to understand the points of view and the biases that the liberal readers would be bringing. And once they did, they could find ways to connect with them and often very powerfully. Um, so I feel like I've been going on long enough. Um, I really wanna know what you all want to know, what you would like to ask me. I know there were some uh, questions early on that were sent in ahead of time. So I think it'd be great if we could start with questions. I'm happy to tell you more about journalism or the New York Times or my book, um, but what would be great right now would be if Pam could, um, could um, come back in and, and ask the questions. Thank you very much, Trish, for all that wonderful advice. I hope you all enjoyed this amazing presentation. And now Trish will be answering some questions that were sent to us um, prior to the webinar. And if you have any questions in the meanwhile, you can um, put it in the Q&A box and I will be reading through those as well. 
So first question, I would like to enlarge my network and reach my social media contacts. There are some that I only saw one or two times. What is the best way to approach them? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think that um, when people just want to connect to you generally, um, you might think, I don't know about that, but maybe maybe the best way to approach them is with something really specific. Like, what's the reason you want to connect to them? Do you want to tell them about an event or a product? Or I think it helps if there's something specific. If If it feels like someone wants to reach out to you just because they're trying to get a lot of followers or a big, you know, I have X number of connections on LinkedIn or whatever, it feels very impersonal. So I think it's important to make it personal and to say why you're reaching out to them. Um, sometimes people reach out to me on LinkedIn and say they read my book and, and, and they thought it was interesting. And by the way, I live in Australia in the middle of the fires. I mean, I once had like 20 emails back and forth with this guy who was so interesting who lived in Australia who was in the middle of the fires a couple of years ago. So I think that if you can just be human and personal and specific um, and not general and not make it seem like you're just collecting names. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. So second question, how can we learn or improve different communication styles in writing for short emails? By style, I mean delivering different moods and types of relationships. For example, respectful, elegant, intimate. And um, they would like some examples for business and some examples for personal relationships. You know, I think it goes back to the thing that, we're that we were talking about. No, that I was lecturing about. I wish I could see you all. Because it really is about your audience um, and who you're writing to. So I... I do a lot of work writing and editing op-eds for a communications firm in Washington. And the woman who runs it is fabulous. And she knows lots of reporters and she writes quick little notes to them, just quick little, I mean, you know, we've all, we can all read everyone else, everyone's email and they're personal and that she refers to something that they just wrote and, but she knows them. She's had an ongoing relationship with them. So that's why I think it's all about, sorry, I'm just reading a note somebody just oh, put up. Um, that's why I think it's all about the relationship you have. So if you're writing to someone you know well, it can be very brief and very casual. If it's someone you've never met, it has to be a little more structured. I write texts and emails all the time to people I know, never using capital letters, never using punctuation. Since I'm a writer, that would be a really weird thing to do if I was reaching out to someone I didn't know. So. The biggest problem I see in business writing is that even in business emails, business everything, it's too long and it's not too formal, it's too jargony. Um, using the jargon of business is really off-putting to people, I think even to people in that business. So the simpler, the shorter, and the more direct you can be, I think that's best in every situation, but the tone of whether you wanna be funny or formal or personal, it's totally a question of how well you know the person you're writing to. And think about how you would feel if, let's say you don't know the person that well. So if you were getting something from them, what would you want the tone to be? So I think you can, can sort of go off of that when you're figuring out your tone. That's great advice. The simpler, the better. <laughs> So what is the best way to communicate when you are saying no to someone's request or offer and provide a counter offer? I mean, I guess it depends on what the offer is. It would be interesting to know, like if somebody's asking you for something and you want to say no, but you'll do something else, like I'm not sure what kind of thing they might be asking you for. Like, are they, you know, I, I still do journalism. I might be asking someone for an hour on the phone to interview them and they might not want to give me that much time. Mm -hmm. So maybe they would write back and say, I can't give you an hour, but I could do a Q and A by email, would that work? So I think that a lot of what happens is that in life is that people say no, because they don't have time and they feel bogged down. So sometimes if you're worried that someone's gonna say no, it's probably a good idea to give them options 
so that they won't just say no, that, you know, I would really like to talk to you for an hour, but if you can't do that, how about an email exchange? I mean, either you can give options or if you're the person who's rejecting, maybe you can give an option that would take less time or you could steer them to someone else in your organization if it's a work thing and ask them to take care of it. But also if people can jump in and ask questions whenever they want, that would be fine with me. And if the person who asked that question wants to give me more specifics about the situation you're thinking of, that would be great. The, you know, because if it's more specific, maybe I could be more helpful. Also, I must say, what do I know, right? Like <laughs> I, I worked in management, I worked as a reporter, I've worked in a lot of different places, but every place is different. So it's, you all know your own situations way better than I ever will. So it, it, that's often the way to come to the best solution is to understand what you would be comfortable with. Okay. So if the person who wrote this question is here, maybe they can pop it in the Q&A box and clarify a little bit more about that. Um, so let's go forward with the next question. A coach once told me, some words are powerful and gain a person's attention more than others. I think he means, for example, for personal relationships, using the words lovely, wonderful, or unlimited. What do you think would be an example of powerful world, powerful words? I mean, that's a tough one. I, I think it, uh, I don't know if there are any words that are inherently powerful. I think it depends on the context. Um, some words people would love to hear in one context, they would find offensive in another context. Um, you know, you want your boyfriend to tell you he loves you. You don't want your boss to tell you he loves you. So I'm not sure that I think there are powerful words. I think there are words that are overused a lot. When I was writing my book, my agent or my editor, I can't remember which one told me I used the word really a lot. So I searched for the word really, and it was like everywhere. And I just deleted it throughout the book. Um, so I think some of us qualify our language too often with adverbs that aren't really doing anything. Um, but I think the most powerful language is simple and direct and a lot of nouns and verbs because it gets kind of squishy and long with too many adverbs. And also passive voice, like this isn't about powerful words, it's about sentence structure. But whenever you back into something, you know, it would be nice if you can't, you know, it, you don't wanna back into things, you wanna use active words and active nouns. But I don't know about powerful words. I, maybe someone wants to tell me more about what the motive for that question is. Um, Cause I think it's all context. Okay, so we got a question from the attendees. Um, Valerie says, any recommendations for building relationships with those who operate very differently from the way that you do? I just think it's really hard. I mean, it, do they operate differently? Is it a client? Is it someone you have to do a lot of close work with? Um, uh, I worked I did a lot of work last year for a big corporation I probably shouldn't name, but a big global corporation. And everyone was always very cautious and sort of not very helpful and, and like speaking in jargon all the time. So you never knew quite what they wanted. You always felt like there was a subtext. I eventually concluded I couldn't work with people like that because their way of working was so different from mine. I've, hard, I've never, actually had never felt that way before. Most people, I feel like you might have this idea about what they're like, and then you get to know them and you find common ground and you can find ways to do things together. But that experience did make me think that if you're, if you operate, I'm sort of blunt and direct, if you operate very differently from the people you're trying to operate with, sometimes it just doesn't work. But mostly I think, you can start out thinking, well, I don't know what I'm going to think of these people. And you almost always find some connection. And that's what you have to look for, that connection. Yeah, finding common ground. All right, so um, 
Let's see. What are some short emails, greeting cards, or texts that you have read that were memorable to you? <laughs> oh, it's funny. I just, you said birthday cards. There's some brilliant birthday cards out in the world. And I just, a friend of mine just had a sort of big birthday and I, I sent her the card because it was something like rolling downhill fast. Um, and it's, it said a lot, um, but it was very simple. I think some greeting card writers are some of the best writers around. Yeah. I, I'm not one of the best writers around. I think what I try to do in, in texts and in, um, and in emails is be really direct and really simple, but also kind of friendly. I mean, I used to have an aversion to, you know, exclamation points and all the, you know, just all, the, but I don't anymore because I do think that text and email can easily be misunderstood. And if you want, and sometimes you just have to get across the feeling um, by using an emoji or an exclamation point or something, because I tend to have a really dry sense of humor. And sometimes I realize I think I'm being funny and I'm just sounding like a jerk. So I think sometimes you need to get across the tone. Um, but mostly I think people just like emails where the subject line tells you what the person wants and things no longer than three sentences or even less because I feel like everyone's on their phone now. I happen to be on a computer now, but most, mo I do a lot of work on the phone. I think most people do, they're very mobile. Um, well, when it's, when it's not COVID, they're mobile and they're reading and working and texting all over the place. And so when you're, you've got to anticipate that people are reading something on a small screen and that calls for being brief. Thank you. Mm, what are some common mistakes we should avoid in formal writing? To me, the biggest one is jargon. And I think that people don't always know jargon because they're in a certain industry and they get used to it. And you just, every industry, even every company has their own jargon. Like when I was at, I was a reporter and an editor at the Wall Street Journal and and you know, we had editors and we had copy editors. And I guess I thought all newspapers were the same. And I went to the New York Times and the first day my new boss says, you know, you should do this and then the backfielder will edit it. And I'm like, I didn't want to ask questions. I was brand new. I had no idea what a backfielder was. It was a certain kind of editor within their structure. And so you have to be really, I think those that's the biggest mistake in any writing, whether it's an op-ed for the public or whether it's within your organization. There's something very off-putting about jargon. Um, it makes people, sometimes I feel like it makes the writer seem like a robot. I mean, there is more and more AI generated writing now. And sometimes I've seen AI generated writing that's more familiar and more relaxed than what I see coming out of humans. Um, which is really scary. I just think that people, especially in marketing and um, public relations and a lot of different parts of corporate life have a kind of, um, they fall back on words that everyone uses all the time and they just start to feel, you know, dead. I think it's the best way to not sound like that is to always think, how would I explain it to my husband or my wife or my friend or my kid? Just use regular conversational language and I think people will respond better. Thank you. I mean, it can be formal in the sense it can be polite with punctuation and everything, but it, it needs to, it will feel more personal and more real if you cut out all the jargon. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have any tips on how to best get your message across on social media channels? You know, I think it's hard. I spend an inordinate amount of time on Twitter. I know people like to trash Twitter, but I really like it. I feel like I'm in this sort of global conversation. And certainly during COVID, I've learned a lot. I've read a lot of, you know, preprint science papers, and it's been, it's fascinating to me. Um, I think like if you're retweeting an article that you found interesting, um, 
don't just retweet it by saying this was interesting, which I do plenty of times myself. I don't actually post that much on Twitter. I just kind of lurk around Twitter. But I see the, the ones that I really respond to, and then I'll read through sometimes a lot of the comments. Um, if you found something interesting, pull the one line or the one sentence or the one fact out that you found interesting, because then I think people are more likely, that will give them some idea of what you find interesting, but I think they're also more likely um, to read the article. Um, I'm a big fan of Instagram because I love photos, um, but I have a private Instagram. I'm, I have a certain aversion to posting on social media because for many years I was in management at the Times and it always seemed risky. I think it's risky for journalists to have a, they're expected to have a big social media profile, but it's also risky. I never wanted to appear to be a person. I didn't want people to know what my politics were. I didn't want them to know what party I was registered in. I just, I wanted to be neutral and and so I have a very, very small social media presence, but neutral does not get you anywhere in social media. Um, I think that you can get attention on social media by being funny, um, by having funny photos, uh, interesting photos or videos, and just by pulling out some surprising detail from something and then linking to whatever that is. Thank you. Mm, let's see. Okay, this is a good one. Which are the best practices for email communication in 2021? Um, I think you should put the why you're writing, if you can, in a very shortened version in the subject line. Don't say catching up. Don't say need your help on something. Don't say, I mean, don't, don't be too vague. Um, People have made fun of me at various points in different jobs for having email subject lines that are really long with no with nothing in the body. But it's then it's almost like, you know, then it's like texting. Um, but I think that people don't want to have to open an email if they don't have to. So if all you want to say to someone is, I'll see you at 530, just put that in the subject line. I'll see you at 530, period. Um, if you want them to come to a meeting. And you think it's it's the they need to prepare for it. Um, you might say, you know, urgent meeting at five thirty, and then in the email you might just say we're going to talk about X, and it would be good if you did Y before you got there. Just be really explicit about what you want, because you always have to remember now. Even people who do not have heavy email burdens are, are getting a lot of email. And people, you know, some people just get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and they are scanning those subject lines, trying to decide what to actually open. So if, you're su if your subject line doesn't make them want to open it, you know, they just won't. That's true. Yeah. The subject line is very important. And we have two more questions here. So if the attendees have any more questions, um, feel free to put it in the Q&A box and I'll read those right after. Um, do you have any advice on how to say no politely via email? I think it's hard. I'm always sort of apologizing to people. I mean, I guess, you know, my way of doing it would be you never want the person to feel badly for asking, right? You never want to make anyone feel foolish. Mm -hmm. So I, and I also don't like to spin out long, complicated lies because I think people always get caught in them. I like brief little lies. Um, I think they're safer. So if somebody's asking me to do something that I really don't want to do, I just say, oh, I'm so sorry. I really wish I could, but I have plans that day and there are plans that cannot be broken. You know, like if it's an event, that's something you can get away with. If it's like, if, it's t if there's no time on it, it's more difficult. If someone says, I'd really like to talk to you sometime about, you know, your experience with whatever, could we have coffee sometime in the next three months? <laughs> you can't really say, no, I don't have time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you really, really can't bring yourself to do it, um, you can say, 
you wish you had time to meet with people you don't know, but unfortunately you don't. And if there's a specific question they had for you that you could answer by email, you'd be happy to answer it. Like maybe give them another little bone, but um, it's, it's harder when it's really open-ended. But the fact is that really busy people, um, if they start saying yes to all those things, they won't have time to get anything done that they need to get done. So it's a problem. So I think the most important thing is to not, is to not make someone feel foolish for having asked because, you know, I think it's important to be nice to people just morally and ethically, but mm -hmm. it's also important because you never know who you're gonna run across later in your life and what they're going to be doing. And, um, how successful they will be or whether they could have an impact on your life. So I think for besides the fact that it's the right thing to do, I think self-preservation um, argues for always being really polite to people. That's not the same as always saying yes. You just say no politely. Yeah. Finding a way to be kind, but no, yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> mm, okay. So last question. What are your favorite persuasion techniques to use in writing? Um, one thing I like to do, because I write a lot of op-eds for people now, is there's sort of a, there's one structure that I think is sort of interesting. It's like, people believe this, but actually, if you look at this, that's not really right. You know, and you sort of point out some kind of fallacy or confused thinking in the way like, you know, most people think that spending money on space exploration is a waste, but guess what? If you look at what we've gotten out of space exploration, this, this, and this, um, there are things that you never thought of. It's the kind of the things you never thought of. That's something that I think can be very helpful in persuasion. Um, you know, I think the hardest persuasion, I've seen this both when I was the op-ed editor and when I try to write things for people, if you're trying to make an argument for something that most people think is good, you know, like we need to give more money to poor people, you know, not that many people will really disagree with that, but they might disagree with it if it means their salary is going to be reduced. So, you know, if you take these sort of ideas, you know, we should all have health care, we should take care of poor people, and you don't have something new and surprising, you're not going to get anywhere. So if you're if you're making an argument kind of in an arena that's written about a lot, it's much harder. You have to be more surprising. So something surprising is sort of the key, is the key attribute, I think, of persuasion of persuasive pieces that um that I've written or that I've published. Thank you. And we have a question here from Toby. He says, in a business email newsletter, what are your thoughts about integrating a bit of personal? I like it. I think it's, I think, I think it makes a big difference. Um, like there's a New York Times columnist named Frank Bruni, and I've known him for a long time. So I do know him as a friend, but I don't see him that often. And he, in addition to writing a couple columns, he also does a newsletter every week. And, you know, he's taken to putting in pictures of his dog and, you know, he's just, he's put personal things in. And I find I really like it. Now, I'm not sure whether I like it partly because I already know him, but like there are other people, um, there are other newsletters I get. One is Tim Harford, who writes about statistics and numbers. He writes for The Guardian, he's English, I think. I think he sometimes puts personal things in his, I mean, there's a lot of sub stacks now that a lot of you might follow, I don't know. It's like as people are sort of leaving media organizations and starting their own instead of blogs now, they have sub stacks, right? And, um, and a lot of them have something personal about the writer because they're trying to build an audience and they're trying to sort of go out and essentially form their own individual media companies. I think it's hard to do that unless you have a feeling for the person. So to me, it makes sense to have some personal stuff. Okay, great. 
So I think that that's all for the questions. Um, yes. So I think that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trish, for answering those questions and for an amazing presentation. It was really a pleasure to have you with us and for you to host a webinar for a small world. Well, thank you for having me. And um, it was great meeting you. Okay. It was great meeting you too. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the webinar. <laughs> Have a great night. You too.